Okay, we can get started, guys. Oh, really? Yeah. So I wanted to introduce Greg, Greg and Dom, and uh, they found each other by being builders, that, and Greg wanted some help on building these cross-country plates, so we'll be hearing about that. But I was fortunate enough to have this build team around when we started to build uh, Discus launch gliders. So all the guys who built pickles know these guys as the people who are the brain trust for building our DLGs. And uh, even Ken's been building the, the last of the bunch. So we've been building like three generations of those gliders. So while they've been building the cross country things, they've been building the, uh, we've all been building the DLGs. So we've just been really happy happy to have these guys here and Greg moved away for a while now he's back so things are going looking good for the club on that that side of it um, and when I first met Greg I was really impressed by his uh, he had a convertible rabbit a Volkswagen rabbit I thought, it's really a cool car for a guy who seems kind of like an engineer you know kind of a nerd <laughs> it, it turns out he had a convertible rabbit because he liked to fly around with his friends, or drive around with his friends, and look at airplanes up in the sky, and go like 40 miles or however long they, they flew them. So, anyway, why don't you guys take it away and let's uh, let's talk about cross country planes. I've been doing this a long time. I'm not sure how long, 20 years, more than 20 years. Um, why fly cross country? Why would we do this? Well, it's the purest form of soaring that mimics full scale soaring. So you're essentially going for distance or speed in a race and it's just thermal and run, thermal and run, thermal and run. Very pure. Um, sometimes there's only one launch in the whole day and that's all you need to, to get your time. So that can be a lot of fun. Um, it presents endless technical challenges looking for continuous improvement. So. I, I did give a presentation here four or five years ago. If anybody wants it, I can get a copy of it to you. It's on YouTube, actually. Oh, okay. Um, fantastic. Um, we started out with some very crude models that were copies of Joe Wirtz's planes that I just happened to see when I ran into him. And we went from there, and then there's been a long discussion uh, with uh, Dominic and myself and Joe Wirtz and Mark Drella and Philip Kolb and anybody else who was involved in the in the sport trying to figure out like what's the best way to really go at this and trends have changed and materials have changed and electronics have changed things have changed so as as the things that evolve around you it allows you to make better and better airplanes every time and that's what we've done uh, it promotes team building so y this is not a solo sport you need a pilot you need a driver you need a navigator and it doesn't hurt to have a fourth person there to take over and you don't have to have those designated for one run you can swap around as people get tired or come into different areas of their own strengths and uh, it, it keeps the team fresh if you can uh, bring a really good skilled crew and everybody can do what they're best at and cover for everybody else's role as well. And it's really fun. Um, this and DLG for me are the most fun of all the types of soaring and um, I mean I'll always be doing this. It's, it's really really fun. Okay so how to get started. Well First thing is you got to run into somebody who happens to have the same interests, which I did many, many years ago. Another pilot by the name of Julian Tamez in Houston, Texas, and he had flown with Joe Wirtz and another pilot named Jim Ferris, and they'd come back from California and made their own planes, and, and that's how I made my copy of my first plane, um, and we just got the excitement going from there. Um, read up on the events. There's a web page on RC groups and there are a couple of other XC soaring pages that have come up over the years and are still archived and you can get a hold of them and there's also um, RC soaring digest and there are quite a few articles if you're willing to wade back through the back issues of RC soaring digest um, there's a lot of information out there so you can find out what's been done 
what's current, um, how to go about this, and, and really, really dig in. You want to make connections with people who already have teams. So you don't want to try to start this up and go at it alone from scratch and build it. Because it's a long slog to get from there to even getting on the course can take a while. Um, <clears throat> so you want to make connections with people who have planes, teams, and vehicles. And that'll allow you to kind of merge in, find your spot, and then start to build your skills and start to take on more responsibility in the team and learn how to get better and better. And then eventually as the sport grows and there are enough airplanes and enough people involved, you can show up and then split and have two teams and go off and race each other or however you want to do it. And it doesn't have to be like us versus them. It can, it's just like uh, some days you might even divide up differently how you divide your teams. You want to join with someone who, has the, who, who, who needs the skills that you have. So, for example, if you're really good with electronics, um, you could drop into the navigator spot right away um, and start playing with the, some of the toys that I'll show you here and calculating altitudes and distances and how long is it going to take to get to the next turn point and how high do I need to be to make it to the end, things like that. And then you want to practice with a plane to get as familiar as you can with the plane. And you want to start with something simple and then get more complex as you go from there. And I can show, I have a couple examples here, and then if you go back and look at my earlier presentation, it goes through more of the whole history of how this evolved from very, very crude, simple airplanes that were still quite competitive up to what we have now that's actually quite sophisticated. Evolution of the electronics. <clears throat> okay. Long, long time ago, there's a device called the Ace Sniffler. It's a Vario. Uh, it was on ham frequencies, or I think 53 megahertz. Uh, there weren't very many frequencies. Um, they sometimes would get out of tune or would come in not perfectly tuned, and you had to play with the tuning. Um, the antenna wires would break very easily. The range was okay, but not great. It was sometimes better with an aftermarket receiver, sometimes not better with an aftermarket <laughs> receiver. Um, <clears throat> they were better if you put much longer antennas in the wing, you could get a little bit higher. Not a great thing, but it's definitely better than not having one, but they were kind of finicky. Um, that was the, the earliest thing. And, and you could put what's called a total energy probe on it. And uh, I saw Joe Wirtz flying with one of those things at, at easily 5,000 feet. So it, it could be done, but it's a, it's a bit of a technical challenge to get the level of, of connectivity that you need to be competitive in a race out of that device. And from there, we went to another device called a Piccolario, which was about a quarter the size of that ACE. Um, it was plugged into your um, radio so you could trigger it and tell you the altitude at any given time. It, would, uh, it, it was a better Vario. You could still put a total energy probe on it. Uh, it would give you uh, how much you've climbed in a certain amount of time and tell you your altitude, which was really nice, uh, especially out on course, because sometimes you think you're at a certain altitude and you're nowhere near that. So it, was, it would keep you honest. Like if you wanted to be at 1,200 meters and you thought you were, but it told you you're only at 700, then you got to go back and be patient and get more altitude. <clears throat> the next evolution up was one called a Sky Melody. And it, functionally, it was very comparable to the Piccolario. It came with its own total energy probe, which some people like to install way back in the fin to get it out of the disturbance of the, of the nose. Um, it's modular and pieces plugged together so it was easier to hide in a fuselage. Um, both of them had a pretty good range. Um, I'm not, is that the one we still have or there's still another? Maybe 
we've got them all, I think. Yeah. <laughs> we, we didn't kind of collect junk. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's still very good. I think we still have one of those. Uh, they're they're a very good device. Um, certainly competitive. Uh, you don't need to go any farther than that. You could still do it with a Piccolario, actually. Then the the latest innovation. This one came out a couple years ago. The RC Electronics T3000. This was originally designed for triangle racing, GPS triangle racing, with giant scale planes, and you put up three beacons and make triangles around as far as you can go and you have to decide if you're going to leave the triangle and climb up more and get more laps. Um, we haven't really looked at that because it's a whole other event and you got to get an expensive scale plane to play in that in that realm. But somebody asked them, hey, could you rewrite the software a little bit and make it work for cross country? And sure enough, they did. So this device is like a miracle. It's like having an extra eye almost in the plane. Um, it has the Vario in it. It's not as good as the Piccolario Vario, I think, as far as uh, selecting the rate and it's just not quite as responsive, but it certainly works. There's, it's, you're not losing much by using that Vario. Um, it has a GPS logger in it and it has a transmitter in it it transmits back to a small handheld unit that's got a screen that's readable in the sun in a car that tells you how fast you're climbing, what part of the circle you're climbing in when you're going around and what part you're sinking in. It tells you like how fast you're going up. It gives you the altitude and it has a little built-in map with a a yellow line that's pointing at the turn point and it tells you how far you've deviated left or right from aiming at the turn point. So this now keeps you really on track. For example, if you drifted with a the thermal off to the side and you want to take a direct line to the turn point, you can do that. If your road curves a little bit left, a little bit right to go around some obstacle, plane doesn't have to do that anymore. It goes straight down the road. The other thing that's nice about it is we used to fly out of pickup trucks and you would usually fly with the vehicle ahead of the plane so that you would not overfly the turn point because it's very easy if the plane is ahead of the vehicle you're guessing where that turn point is unless you actually catch up to it and then you're racing to catch up to it and now you've gone past it and by the time you get reoriented, you've lost a quarter mile. Um, if you fly with a plane behind, then you can drive up to the turn point, let it come up, make the turn point and go, which is nice, but sometimes the sun is behind you and you might not want to do that, but you don't really have a choice unless you want to risk going past it. With this device, it doesn't matter where the car is. You can be ahead, you can be up behind, you can park a quarter mile short of the turn point if it's an out and back and you just park there and watch it run until it hits that cylinder and it goes beep 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 it tells you you made it turn around and come back so it especially with a convertible you want to fly because everybody's looking forward you want to fly ahead of the vehicle and this allows you to do that you can just fly drive behind it and then when you hit the turn point you make the turn and then you catch up with the plane. So we noticed that when we before we had this if you were really having a good day you could have a pretty straight triangle on a triangle course. But with this thing if you're having a really good day it's like you drew it with a ruler. It's so straight. Um, so Electronics have continued to evolve and, and they've got some pretty nice stuff now. Greg, what about the uh, laundry that comes with the uh, RC equipment now? You know, I don't have that. I know the Free Sky and, and um, the Spectrum and the, the Tyrannus, I think, have that. <coughs> I, I don't know what the range is on that. And I don't know how the Vario works, whether it's a pressure Vario or GPS or some other device. Um, 
nobody's using that in racing right now. Um, doesn't mean you couldn't do it. Um, I don't know. You'd have to try it. Is it worth looking at? I mean, I, I know people like them, but I don't know what the capabilities of it are. And you push the envelope. Yeah, and the, we're always pushing the envelope of higher, faster, farther, straighter, um, everything. So evolution of airframes. Um, as of the last presentation, we had a pretty good plane. We were flying the 10th version and building the 11th version. Um, I had a discussion with Philip Kolb who designed the wing of the last one that we built and had a lot of input on that. Actually, he designed that fuselage as well. And there was a point where he told me that reducing the frontal area of the fuselage was worth more than anything he could do with the wing beyond Mark Drella's Supra, which is like 2003 or something like that, which I thought was an interesting concept. But then if you've got the smartest low Reynolds number aerodynamics guy in the world using his own software, unless you've got a better tool, you're not going to be able to beat that. You might be able to match it, or you might be able to trade one characteristic for another, but realistically, people are still flying the Supra platform, and it's tough to beat. So we stuck with the wing that we had, and we decided to um, make a better fuselage. And that's, that's what that is, and we'll get to that. The other thing he told me, and, and we were quite clear about this when we were going through the design process, is that the most effective variable that affects your performance is wing loading. The higher the wing loading, the better the performance of the plane in cross country. Heavier. Yes. Now, you have to trade that for visibility. As the airplane gets smaller, the maximum altitude you can go to gets lower. And my other presentation goes through all the modeling we did with regards to top speed, thermal climbing ability, camber versus no camber, um, and the, the wing loading, the size, the visibility, and all that. And <clears throat> we did not settle on the smallest airplane when I went through that design revision because I was not willing to give up the altitude that it would have taken to get to that. Visibility. For the visibility, yeah. So I think we ended up with a pretty good airplane. Um, and again, it depends a lot on what the conditions are that day. So there are certain days when the bigger plane is going to win because the, the best air is higher, and if you can fly in it, you can take advantage of it. There are other days when the smaller airplane is going to win, and a few years ago at Montague, Philip Kolb showed up with the smallest, heaviest airplane that's ever showed up at cross country, and he beat all of us. So he's right, or at least he, he's good, or he's right, or both. Probably both. Do you, do you fly within the FAI restrictions? Five yeah, that's, that's like the boundary of the box you're trying to play in. So five, kilograms. five kilos or the wing loading, okay. which you're, you're not going to hit the wing loading. Right. Or you're going to go so small that you're flying in really small. Like that. Okay. Are you allowed to use the market or sort of thing like that? The spotters in the car can use binoculars. The problem is the field gets narrowed down so far, it's really hard to find the plane. Um, so you could in theory, but nobody is. So here's what I was talking about, XC10 to XC11. If you look at the plane on the left, that's a Gordon Jennings designed fuselage, which uh, we borrowed the mold some 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, it's gotten passed around and moved, and I'm not even sure exactly where it is. Do you have it? Okay. <laughs> it's still there if anybody needs one of these. 
Come talk to us. Um, it's a really good fuselage. You can fit a lot in it, um, including a big Vario, uh, full-size servos, huge batteries, um, and you can make a bigger plane with it. So you can make that 176-inch Supra if you want. And that makes a really, really nice plane. I mean, if you just want to have something to go out and fly, and fly and fly and fly and fly and fly, that fuselage with a four meter super wing on it is a fantastic flying plane. What we built is a little bit smaller than the four meter Supra. Um, so you get a little bit higher wing loading. Uh, that particular version had a wing cut with a drop bow. I believe Noel was the other person that helped me cut that one out years ago. Um, and then the problem is the panels are really big, so you have to adjust the wire sag out by hand with templates, and you never get it exactly where you want it. And on paper, if you run the modeling software, that kind of thing makes a big difference. In practice, I'm not sure how much difference it makes, but it's not quite molded perfection. So uh, after having that conversation with Philip Kolb about the fuse, we freed up a little bandwidth and decided to make our own fuse mold. So that was based on a drawing from Philip Kolb. We, we custom molded, we made a plug. The size was made exactly for that sized airplane. It's not oversized. And we made it only big enough to fit the latest stuff in there with not a lot of extra room for anything but some ballast under the wing. And then we also found someone to cut a CNC cores for the wing so the airfoil was much more accurate. And that gives us, you know, a little bit of an edge over the, the other one. And if you, we have flown these two airplanes at the same time, not raced against each other, but flying around. And the newer one definitely is a little bit slicker and flies a little bit faster than the older one. What's the maximum diameter of the fuse? On this one? Mm, so that's the 11, right? What, three inches tall maybe at the, at the deepest? It's not a lot bigger than an F3J fuse is right now. What's the width? Two and a half inches maybe? Two, two and a half inches, two, yeah. You don't want to go too small because there are some landing stresses involved and the smaller it gets, the thicker the wall needs to be to take that. Um, and you, you do have to fit ballast in there. So, um, <clears throat> oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we just made what fit the task exactly and not something that had to be adapted to to the task. Is the, fin, is the fin part of the mold? The fin is not part of the mold, which gives you the option of putting any kind of tail on there you want. Um, sometimes the mold, like the, the last one we did, the other mold had a stub fin, so you have something to glue to. This one we just glass it on. It's just cleaner that way. These are winch launched, just like a F3J plane. Yeah. Yeah, it's got a, a hook. They're actually not bad to launch, oddly enough, um, even at 11 pounds. You said something like more than one launch, but isn't it really only get one launch, basically? You can launch as many times as you want, but if you pick the window right and you, you get the air, so you, That's can, your, you can launch, but then you take off. You can't. Yeah. You don't move the launch site, right? You always no, you have to come back and start over oh, okay. if you need to start That's over. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> um, we weren't really looking to do this, right? To go any farther than what we had, no. but we just happened to luck into a dumpster-dived wing center section from a Royale. 
and we got a couple of uh, visual blam rejects from uh, Don, Don, Peter. Don Peters, the maker of this, that happened to have the same joiner box as the center section because the tips we had were in really rough shape. The center section wasn't too bad. The tips, you know, they could be rebuilt, but it was a major project. So we really lucked into getting these uh, tips from, from Don Peters. <clears throat> and we put together this Royale wing, which is Drella's Supra foils tweaked a little bit, a little bit bigger. I think it's four meter. Yeah, it's four meter. It's four meter, but it's a little bit less cord. So this is the smallest cross country plane that we've ever made as far as wing area. Um, it's not the smallest one we've raced against. There are a couple, well, couple the out there. Two, right? I mean, the Icon, the two Icon 2 is a little smaller area. than that. The plane that Philip Cole brought was the smaller. The Prestige was smaller than this. And the X2 might be a little bit smaller than this. The John's oh, flying. John, yeah. 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 Um, but this one's down in that range and it's pretty fast. Um, we have a course record with this airplane at California Valley. Yeah. We had a good day where we had one launch and we went around and it was in a respectable time. And there was... We, we, we did both airplanes. Wasn't it like the 11, 11 and then this one, the 12? It, so 11, it like, might have I been. did it. Yeah. I did like a, a good, great A time. good time, yeah. We did this and it smoked yeah. the course. It was like, what, 30, 28 minutes? Something like that, yeah. yeah. It was normally, 45 miles an hour. Yeah, we're, we're normally used to seeing like, you know, 45 minutes and yeah, 28 minutes. Yeah. And, so, and it was a ridiculous day. I mean, it was one of those days. Actually, yeah. once we got on the course, I never turned. Yeah. Just, just flew right it, we just flew faster in the sink and slower in the lift. And the lift was so good that we could get around on that. And by the time we got to the last turn point, there was more than enough air to get us back there. And the beauty of having that Vario is even if your car is topped out at 55 miles an hour, once you make that decision to go for the finish line, you can push the plane as far ahead as you can see it and get over that line and the GPS will log it and the car comes and catches up a few minutes later. What was the average speed? I think it was around 45. 45. Yeah. So you were hitting better than that at peak speeds. We were hitting better than that at peak speeds. You, you don't actually want to go much more than 55. If you're going a lot more than 55 miles an hour, you're either in really, really, really bad sync or you made a big mistake and you gained too much altitude and now you have to burn it. Whereas you should have started lower and sooner and got there on a flatter glide path because it's actually in the drag bucket of the airfoils to stay in that regime. Right. You know, goal and return things, or how, how does it all work? There's a, a wide variety of different tasks that could be assigned. Some of the most popular ones, for example, are open distance. So they put out a map that has nine turn points, official turn points. And those can be assigned in order, or they can be open order. And you pick or they pick how you get from one to the next one and whoever gets the farthest that day gets the highest score. <clears throat> that used to be a popular event. Um, when the really good guys on really good days started coming in, you started to get in the range of 106, 118 miles on a really good day. The next event that they would have would be uh, closed course speed, for example. So that could be goal and return, it could be a triangle, it could be six points land back at the, at the origin, uh, whatever they pick, and whoever gets around the fastest gets the highest score. <coughs> it 
if nobody finishes, whoever gets the farthest gets the highest score. If one or two people finish, then they have a formula for scaling the non-finishers, depending on how much difference there is and how many people finished. And then another one would be called a post task. So you would have a window from two hours to three hours. So you want to go at least two hours and you're not allowed to go over three hours. But you want to go the fastest speed in that window. So you would fly and try to rack up as many miles as you can until you get to the two hour mark. And then you have to evaluate the conditions and decide am I bettering my average speed by continuing or am I hurting it by continuing. And then at some point you have to decide okay it's time to cut it because the air is getting worse and it's, I'm not gaining anything, and you burn what you have and land. Now in a case like that, is that, you just fly in a straight line? Again, that could be a uh, goal and return, it could be a circle, it could be a triangle, whatever course they've laid out for the day. Or it could be an open, as long as you hit the turn points, it can be an open pick, which order you want to go in. Usually, unless it's open distance, and then you're going to land wherever the farthest point is that you could get. And, and that brings up another question. What do you do when you outland when, you know, the, the lift isn't there, it's just not happening for you? Does it all look like this where you're flying? Um, no. Not always. <laughs> uh, some places do. Um, you have a navigator and a driver who are coordinating with a map, uh, like a printout of a map, and looking at the terrain and looking at the map and deciding do we have enough altitude to get to the next safe landing spot. If you do, then you make the hop and go there. If you gained on the way, then you make another decision. Do I have enough to get to the next one? <coughs> at some point, sometimes you have to decide. It's like it's too risky to try and go farther. And you use like Google Earth or something so to say there's an open field. Like like our like our master like our last race at uh, Sacramento, um, we almost completed a race and we were like on a dirt road and then you know it's it's kind of weird because there's a there's a real dirt road there's a, a gully or a ditch and the other side looks like reeds and I'm like wow there must be a pond or something on the other side and then on the other side right there is um, a, 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 um, a power line. It's like, how are we going to land this thing? And it's like, Greg said, you know, well, we just kind of talked to you. There's this, there's this, there's this. Because when you're a pilot, you're just, you're trying to get the plane up, but you can't. And then, so you have to have someone call you out. So I'm telling them, you know, here's a power line, here's a ditch, all that side, you know, usually we have a field, but this time it's like, I don't know if there's a pond, I don't know what's on the other side. So what Greg had to do was take all the information and literally just, there's like a little bit of grass. He actually just, Planted the airplane there, skidded. I think we actually busted a flap or something like that. Yeah. Was able to land it in a, in a really short distance. So that's actually some of the excitement too. I mean, I've got to a point where we're flying through Cow Valley, you know, and I'm I'm flying all this place. I'm not finding a lift. I'm like, ah, I don't know how to land this thing. And then Greg's actually looking around, I hand it to him. You know, again, there's like power lines, there's a road, there's the gravel. And then, you know, so someone has to like be able to evaluate where to land it. So that's kind of exciting. And sometimes we're, I think the other race too, there was a, a cow farm. You know, just a bunch of cows, there's tin roofs, you know, there's uh, trees right here, vines. It's like, man, how are we going to be able to land this thing? But he ended up being able to thermal out of that one. Yeah. And sometimes but, you're 50 yeah. feet and you get that thermal. Sometimes you got to put it on the road. Yeah. That's the safest thing. Does it allow hand catch? Uh, they allow it, but it would be, a, and I have seen people do it, but it would be a very hard hand catch. Hand catch the plane. They're coming in pretty fast because most of the time, the model and the numbers tell you to fly at full weight. Rarely, it's like a really light day and overcast, and it's never going to really kick on. You might make a decision to take some weight out. 11 pounds is full weight? Yeah, five yeah. kilos. Yeah. So typically you would fly three persons, one pilot and one navigator, one driver? We've three. done it with two, and if the pilot and the driver really know the course, 
then it's not so hard because you already know where you need to go and you've driven it before. But it's better to have three because the third person can be watching the team behind you, they can be watching the team ahead of you, they can be looking for birds, they can be calculating how much altitude you need to finish the course, um, they can be watching cloud formations, uh, things like that, looking for green versus brown fields, all kinds of stuff. And how much uh, electronic intelligence was allowed in this kind of solving contest? Like, for example, auto stabilizing and maybe like automatic flight waypoints and other stuff? There was a team uh, several years ago that was part of somebody's PhD that took an SBXC and put in an autonomous program mm -hmm. before there were drones or any of that. And they actually had an algorithm that would search out until it hit a thermal and it would climb up, calculate when that thermal was deteriorating, GPS the next turn point, and I mean, you can talk about a straight line, that thing had a straight line. Um, <coughs> and it would, it, you could punch in how fast you wanted to allow it to fly. It may, it may go slower than that based on the conditions, but it had a, a whole algorithm to decide how fast it was going to fly. And they would fly in the contest, but not against us for the trophy, because it was pretty effective. But you could beat that plane um, on a good day. Yeah. If you had a good pilot and a good plane, and you knew what you were doing, and just a little bit of luck, you could beat the autonomous plane. But it was not a given to be able to go beat it. It, it was a, a high bar to to match. So, so the competition rule, does, does it say anything about using this kind of autonomous... Uh, you can't use an autopilot. You cannot use autopilot. No. I don't think so. It probably would be an advantage, right? You would stabilize yourself and not be able to find thermals. <laughs> yeah, you want to, you really want to be able to fly the plane. Right, but like, just in case I panic button and then you do a do an auto level. Well, with the GPS, you can, it's telling you your velocity and it's telling you where it is. So if you lo lose sight of it, you can aim it at the turn point. We've and actually done that before. Yeah, right? we've oh, actually. Oh, we've actually, actually can tell you where you are heading? Yes. Yes, yes. Wow. We've used that one time where it was actually <laughs> raining. Um, I got sunspots, I mean, like uh, water stains on my glasses. We were driving down the road and I could tell, you know, hey, things aren't turning out right, you know. The next thing you know, just all the sunspots just blurred my vision. I lost the airplane. And I guess he actually looked at the G, the, the T3000 and said, okay, well, you're not losing altitude. I know which direction you're going. So we actually will get, go, go to the safe spot and, okay, there's the airplane. So we actually used it before. Yeah. Um, we actually used it to recover airplanes. There was one instance where um, Dean Gradwell, who's the guy who does the uh, Montague contest, he was, I don't know, say like 3,000 feet up and we were maybe 2,000. And, and, um, and he's actually passing us up. And he's like, Greg, this guy's beating us. And then, and then and I said, well, Greg had a, a purpose for being a lower because he wanted to stay under the clouds. Well, this guy just literally disappeared. Oh, right. And, and I'm like, Greg, what are we going to do? He just lost his airplane. He's like, well, nothing we can do. Keep flying. And um, I guess later, later that day or the next day, I actually uh, took the chip out of it and were able to locate the airplane. Yeah, it's a total wreck. But, I mean, it's... <laughs> Yeah, I took the chip out of it, or I took the information out of the Off the, the, the GPS, yeah, yeah, we got the GPS. Yeah. Oh, 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 interesting. Yeah. So, so the, you were able to know that, like, how much tilting angles you have on the plane? You no. probably won't, yeah. You no, can but you can, altitude, you can steer it. You can have you can the altitude, steer, but yeah. How do you yeah. know, like, you can oversteer it and flip it or something? Yeah, you oh. just got to, well, you got to yeah. trust that there is some stability It's not like a real plane, yeah. The, the, was it the globe? No. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Not that sophisticated. Okay. Yeah. So you're kind of letting auto balance back to, to the. Yeah, I mean, you want to be flying it the whole time. And as you get practice, you learn to keep it tracked. And with this device, it's actually. Yeah. I think the, thing, the big thing is don't, don't panic, right? Uh, don't get your airplane into a situation where it's in a spin because there's not enough information. You know, just yeah. once you lose it, it's like, ah. And then maybe minimal. Stick movements, yeah. But yeah. You can always but after that. I think once you get into spin, you're not going to be able to catch it. It's so yeah. much uh, delay.
you, yeah. you really, if you lose it or you're disoriented, the best thing is to pull the flaps, pull back on the elevator, and just let it sort of come down slowly. So when you, with the uh, wing design, your, your purpose of putting it in that polyhedral to have uh, stability, hands off. Yeah, you wouldn't, so. you wouldn't build a flat wing yeah. cross country glider. Yeah. <clears throat> Although there were people who successfully flew Dodgson wind songs in the day. Carefully. <laughs> What's a course length, and, and how, how do you really uh, uh, know when you hit the, the corners and do, do the, the others? Uh, the competition also have those same points <laughs> in the course. Um, the the original contests were based on the LSF goal and return, which was 10k out 10k back and that was challenging for a while um, it got to where the airplanes were outrunning that event making it too short so they started getting longer um, open distance again open distance is open distance and I've seen Joe Wirtz go 118 miles on one day so you could go that far Usually on a good day, open distance will go in the 60 mile range. Closed course, uh, a short course would be say 19 miles, right, at Cal Valley, yeah, the triangle. I think it's like 17, 17, and a half. 17 19 right. miles. Um, a long day course would be usually like 40, 45. Do you have judges at the front no. no, you have GPS now. You have GPS in the plane, and the previous revision of it had manual scoring, so you had to visually make sure your plane got pretty close to make sure you're within the circle, which was like 0.2 mile radius. Um, and again, a visual on that is usually well within. But now with this device we have, it actually shows the circle on the little screen and it shows you approaching it and you, it tells you how far it is and you can count it down. 0.4 miles, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, beep, 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 you got it. And you turn. Yeah, turn. Oh yeah, yeah. It, something similar, yeah. Yeah. Or the big boys mean full scale? <laughs> yeah, they're all, they're, they were on it before we were probably. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely fun. Well, well, what's the limitation on visibility being able to see? Now, you heard 5,000 feet. Are you really able to, to see? Or the highest I've gone logged was 1780 meters. And it depends, <clears throat> it depends a lot on the conditions of the day. <clears throat> and the visibility. <clears throat> if it's a uh, foggy, hazy, um, typical California air, it depends on the size of the plane. This plane here starts to get challenging at 1,200 meters. So you don't want to go much above that. But you're betting on it being faster and more efficient so that you don't have to go as high. The, the, the 5,000 I gave you was, um, we actually did a course and we we're taking a break. So I actually got out of the car, sat in the ditch, you know, kind of inclining just right. We we're flying the number eight and I was just climbing, climbing. I, that's how I was getting I was actually on still ground. Still ground, sitting down, clear air with a big wide cord. So that's how I was able to get the 5,000 feet or just the over 5,000 yeah, mile. <laughs> yeah, so that's about the limit of what you can do. Um, I, I had the good fortune of taking a lap around California Valley with Joe Wirtz once with a really old crude airplane and an 
ace vario. And I'm going to estimate that we never went below 4,000 feet. And I don't really know what the, what the height was. And it depends a lot, like I said, on the condition. If you get a day that's after a cold front has blown through, and you've got good, clean, crisp, clear air, and you've got mixed cumulus with blue sky in between, you can see a lot higher than you can on uh, a totally still inversion day in Sacramento where you might be capped at 1,000. You might even be getting nervous at seven, 800 meters. It all depends. Is there a standard length for your reach? Uh, it depends on the field. Um, I think they run six to 900 feet, something like that. But again, you don't need to launch the highest. You only need to launch as high as the thermal is to catch on. And usually it's a good half hour, 45 minutes getting out. I mean, sometimes you get lucky and you go right out, but it usually pays to launch a little early and have patience and watch the thermal activity start to build and get stronger and stronger. And these variables will tell you your climb rate so you know when it's starting to get really hot and that's when you peak your altitude and, and go out on the course. I think there might be one more. Vehicle, okay. <coughs> uh, there's a variety of different ways to go about the vehicle problem. The original, the original original was a, was a pickup truck with a bean bag, but it doesn't have seat belts. So you gotta have seat belts. So we upgraded to trucks with bass boat seats and seat belts. Um, they're really nice in that they swivel. You can fly 360 degrees. You can use the cab as a shield. It's easy communication with a driver. Um, but they do tend to attract unwanted attention from various sorts of people. Um, fish and game. Fish and game, <laughs> yeah. Sheriff, yeah. Department. Highway patrol. And they, they, always, management. they always let you go because you got sea belts, but you just, it just costs you the time to explain that that no, this is, these are not guns in our hands and we're not shooting antelope. Um, so we uh, made a decision to go with a cabrio. Um, it holds four adults. You can pack two or three airplanes and three people, believe it or not, and somewhat comfortably at least get to California Valley. It's discreet. You drive by, there's three guys in a car, nobody says anything. And it's a good everyday driver. So you need a car unless you want a bike to work. So you got to have a car, and that's not a bad choice. It's actually, I've put 70,000 miles, I think, on that one. And it's not much worse than a Corolla for maintenance. There's a couple more. Uh, a popular item amongst some of the people who do this is the Jeep. It's versatile. It comes apart. It goes back together again. It's comfortable. It's got big seats. It holds a lot of stuff. It's not a great everyday driver. It's not something you want to own, at least me personally. Because um, you're, <clears throat> you're paying to have a four-wheel drive, off-road low gas mileage um, vehicle all the time. But it's a great option for racing. So we went to uh, this latest contest uh, about a month ago in Sacramento. We had had a two or three year hiatus <clears throat> without racing. So we decided to start Saturday with a simple polyhedral old airplane. Meaning rudder elevator. Rudder elevator only. Yes, spoilers? No spoilers. No spoilers either. Nothing the the What's that? Uh, <coughs> stop it? Yeah. You, fences, I hit a lot of fences, a lot of poles. <laughs> you have you have to think a little bit more ahead. This is number eight. This is like the third for third version of number eight. 
yeah. You, <clears throat> you have to think a little more ahead on your landing. You have fewer options. Um, so, you know, that, that's a slight disadvantage. Um, the advantage of flying that airplane is uh, it's very easy to fly. It's bigger. You can see it easier. You can see it higher. Um, it, that's a, that's the, yeah, there's, right, there's no flaps, no cutouts. Structurally, you don't need a spar because there's no cutout for anything in there. It's just a one piece center section. It's super stiff, super strong. That one has a carbon wing actually. Um, it's not, it doesn't get into trouble so fast. Like if you pointed it down, it's not gonna overspeed and, and get in trouble really quickly. Um, and it's got a huge wing area so you can fly as high as you want and you're gonna be able to see it. Um, the, on the downside, the top end is not super fast, but we have won quite a few contests with that airplane. So, it, it, you know, it's not, it's not bad, it's just you're trading one, one thing for another. The bottom of the wing is black? Or dark? The bottom of the wing is almost always black, maybe with a stripe for orientation, but black is really good. Is it for more visible or for other people? For more visibility. Black is really good for visibility when you're really high. Um, flash is really good for visibility. Um, this is sparkle, which is good. And then there's also chrome, which is good. Um, you can put like two of these on the wings and one sparkle on the fin. And when you go around a, a, a circle, a corner, it goes flash, flash, flash. And you can see exactly where it is. So, but that's really nice to have. <clears throat> All our planes have that, I think. Go ahead. Sunday strategy, we decide to fly the number 11, which is the one right before this one. Um, we, you give up a little bit of visibility. It's a smaller airplane. Uh, it's not as forgiving. It's got less dihedral. Um, it's, it's still stable in the, in the pitch, but you could get in trouble quicker. Um, it's a smaller wing, a smaller stab, but it has quite a bit higher top end. And having been out a while and coming back and flying the two right next to each other, I was surprised at how much difference there actually was in the top end of this airplane versus the polyplane. <clears throat> and it didn't seem to give up anything in thermaling because you've got camber change on the wing. So you can camber up the wing and bank a really tight turn. Not really tight, but, but surprisingly tight for a big 11 pound airplane. Um, and it, it, it seemed to do pretty well. Uh, and there was some wind that day, right? That we had to go against? Um, yeah, towards the end, right? Yeah. Yeah, the first part of the run was really, really good. We actually had a good run. It's, it's the second part. It was, we had to start issues like crosswind. Crosswinds, you could tell yeah. The air was just changing. It was starting right. to get colder and less uh, thermals, less strong. So it, it got tough. Just, just hit. We didn't hit the window right. <laughs> yeah, and then I'm not sure there was a perfect window. Yeah. It was just an okay window. Um, I mean. A lot of this depends on what time of year you go and how much daylight there is and did a cold front blow through and how windy is it and what kind of visibility is there and who are you flying against and how well prepared are they. Um, there are a lot of, lot of variables that go into flying. We weren't necessarily going there to, I mean we always fly to win, but more we were flying more to get back into the game having been out for a couple of years. Yeah, you could tell he didn't. He forgot what switches did what. I think we had probably like yeah. three or four switches on that radio. I was like, what does this do? What does this do? It's like, wow, you programmed it. How do you? How'd you forget? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, two years no, ago. don't hit that switch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah, this one, this one has like a what is it? Low save, thermal. Um, there's like four switches. There's settings, right? actually five, five. modes uh -huh. on that on that wing. You've got uh, speed, which is I'm not sure if it's reflex or just I think it is very slightly reflexed. The bottom is flat. You've got cruise, which is as the airfoil is cut. 
You've got thermal, which is a little bit of camber. You got low save, which is even more camber. And then you got launch, which is oh, yeah. even more. And we had to go through and kind of adjust, you know, things drift over time. Uh, we had to adjust a bit um, to get everything back how we like it. Yeah. This, this particular plane actually gave us problems. Actually, it, I really like the number 10. The other, number 10 actually seemed like a thermal. Then this one for years, we just had problems. We couldn't get the thermal right. And when I went to Montague last year, um, I, I, I kind of presented it to Rich Tillman, which is the R&R, &R, the other R&R. &R. <coughs> he came over there and got a, uh, what is it, inclinometers or like uh, incidence meters. And sure enough, we had like, uh, I don't know, two degrees of decollage, right? So the, the wind's level and the tail is back like this. So I think we spent, I think about three days trying to get that right between like not gluing it right and putting it on there. But that made a huge difference. That way, when we actually went to this contest, it was a, such a, a different animal. Man, it would behave really well, really fast. I was actually really impressed with it. You know, that's the molded I, stab too, right? Yeah, that's the molded stab. Yeah, I thought we were having problems with the stab because we had a, a bag stab. So I actually made a molded version of it. And the, the, you know, because the, yes. So what we were doing is uh, we actually had this push rod that actually pushes up on it on this side. Mm -hmm. So the, the stab would actually do this kind of stuff. Had a lot of play. So that's why I ended up making the, the molded version. And it actually was a lot stiffer. But yeah, the decollage somehow, I, I think it was always done that way. But it's, it's actually kind of good to go over your airplanes, you know. It's like, why is this not working right? We have yeah. perfect good number 10. It's so stable. You can actually see that thing climb, climb really nice with the fat piece on it. But this one, we could never figure it out. And I guess it was the decollage. Yeah, that and the spongy stab. Yeah, the spongy stab. The hinge on the bag stab was not ideal yeah, yeah. for that kind of configuration um, connection. It had a little bit of, in, instead of just this, there was also a little bit of that going on. Yeah. And uh, at high speeds with a heavy airplane, that sort of thing starts to yeah. show up. So, oh. <laughs> sorry. yeah, he, he, uh, I don't have a, I'm sorry, I didn't bring a version of it. Painstakingly well, it's just the old made school. us I mean, a, a lot of a lot of people have a lot of money. Stab. You can get like CNC molds. Well, I do the old-fashioned <laughs> ways. Like, you basically, get the cores, you bag it, and you polish up the, the bag um, version, make a plug out of it, and then made a mold out. But it actually turned out pretty good. Actually, with that new spread toe, the one that's uh, uh, this one's like a woven one, where it's like maybe one inch weave. This one was the under over. Oh, the yes, yeah, newer stuff. What do they call it? I don't know. Carbolite, there's like a couple Carbolite or um, carbo weave, yeah. Carbo weave, yeah. Yeah, that stuff. Really stiff. So it, it turned out really good. And the, the problem, I guess, was the molding. It was like, ended up putting a lot of spooge in there, too much material. So to get it light was kind of a little difficult. Yeah, the our, uh, bag versions are really, really nice uh, as far as lightness. Yeah. But the actually molded one came out almost as good as the production one. <laughs> Close. Yeah, <laughs> it, looks, it looks pretty good. Yeah. Pretty and it flies perfectly. So. Yeah, I, you had you got some time on the plane. It was pretty pretty good. You thought? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, even watching you fly it the second day. Yeah. I was like, wow, this thing is amazing. Really fast, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the intriguing part about this. I mean, we we fly thermal airplanes and they kind of cruise along, but this thing, it's hauling around with authority. <laughs> and when you fly yeah. a thermal and you can climb it, oh man, it's so nice. Point it to where you want it to go, kind of like an F3B or an F3F airplane. So. Yeah, really yeah. Nice. yeah, yeah. The newer, the newer planes, they, they're fast, they're slick, they track well, and with the GPS steering you, I mean, you can, you can do a pretty good course. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I mean, we're, we're flying these heavy airplanes, and everybody wants the lightest. You know, they're going like forty or fifty. You know, we're we're the other direction. It's like, yeah. Why are you guys having such a hard time flying your fifty ounce airplane? We got eleven pound airplanes. Yeah. Well, as long as we're throwing them, anyways. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's a different, you know, come in, I guess just flying thermals, you know, you, don't, you can't appreciate, but we're actually going on course and being able to spend more time using the variable, I think it actually really improves your, your flying, you, you know, your ability to, to actually push yourself, you know, when you thermal, I mean, if, I, if I'd never done this before, I'd probably thermal and probably stay on the field, well, now I'm, I could probably go like half a mile out of a field with no problem, and well, as long as I had the altitude, I guess. Yeah, and... <laughs> You start to learn like how high you need to be to get back to the field. Yeah. 
how far you can go, how much risk you can take. Because the whole, the whole contest is that. The whole contest is that, yeah. And I think so. Next step. Okay. Um, we don't have any plans to make another plane. We've got one, two, three, four competitive yeah. and planes. We could pull that super super on. <laughs> we could put that back together again. Yeah. yeah. Um, they they range from from the Royale, which is on the fast end, all the way up to that polyplane. And again, it depends on the team. If you were to come out with a team member who was really excited about flying but had no experience, you can take out the polyhedral plane and make a run with it and get somebody some stick time, get them familiar with how it flies and what it's like to fly out of a car instead of standing on the ground and uh, how to make decisions and things like that. So, yeah, we're, we're covered for pretty much anything and uh, again, the teams fluctuate depending on who's available and who wants to go. Yeah. And we just adapt to, uh, to the situation and the conditions and everything. Um, again, in the, the more you can memorize the terrain from previous times being on it, the better, the better you're prepared as you're on the course. Because you're like, okay, I know there's a uh, tin shed down the road that I can usually get a thermal off of. Or I know that it's green on this side and it's brown on that side. Um, or I know that I have to go up for a while in altitude and then the road goes back down. So I need to be higher to get through that gap. But then once I'm over it, I can push a little harder on the other side. And if you're going for the first time, you're kind of finding these things out as you go. If you know the course, then you, you don't rely on the navigator so much to tell you <clears throat> like what's coming. <coughs> and they can focus more on uh, calculating how far you are to the end, how high you need to be, how fast the thermals have been climbing, and, and basically predicting your final run to give you that run at 45, 50 miles an hour with 100 meters left when you cross the finish line, which is what you want. I think John Lyons actually, on one of the races, Montague, he actually had a map. He actually put it where he was actually able to find thermals. So he's like one of the top guys that, yeah, yeah he's hard to beat, but you know, we, we beat him We beat him sometimes. But yeah, I mean, he actually put a map out. And I think even at Montague, there's a certain section we call the Valley of Death. Where yeah. You actually go down, and there's like a creek. All oh, it's all green. And I'm, I think what that's, that's probably taken us down a couple of times, right? Yeah. We actually had to Takes everybody to down. Death. So I guess there's places where there's house thermals. There's you know places where people know that there's actually sites that where you can catch thermals. Same thing, I guess. Yeah. Any anybody have any other questions? I was wondering. Um, like a, what do they call that? FPV. FPV. Um, that, that's against the rules. Uh, people have done them to try to see how it works. Um, a friend of mine had an early version of that, that that was before all this drone stuff was around. And he tried it and he found it quite disorienting at the time. And I'm sure you can learn that skill, but it's not as easy as just sticking it in the plane and, and doing it. I'm not suggesting to use FPV as a video, looking at the terrain, mm -hmm. I think that would be very hard, and more of like getting the sensor of where the plane is pointing at, and of what is the, the, like the ball thing, is that what, what is the... Oh yeah, yeah. fly by wire. Yeah, it's basically you can do fly by wire, yeah. I assume, and then, mm -hmm. and then you just keep on, you don't have to look at the plane. I guess like, 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 instrument, you like instrument flying, right? Yeah, instrument yes. flying. Like, yeah. Yeah. I don't think anybody has a package that fits in a plane right now to do that. I'm sure um, I can do one, but it's not hard. Yeah, I mean, you just have to 
co you know, find the components and code it and all that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, it's, it's very easy to feel, and then I think the yeah. trick is that how do you get the thing come back fast enough so that it doesn't have a huge yeah, yeah. latency. Right. Yeah, yeah, but you can you can fix that. Those things, I think I'm thinking something like 25 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, you should be able to do it. Because yeah, ideally, things don't happen very quickly in this race. Right, right. And also, you are not making sharp turn and no. things stun, so I think it should be fine. Most of the time you're flying in a straight line or you're climbing out as fast as you can climb, right. which means the plane is flying as slow as it can fly. Right. <coughs> I, I, think, I think it will definitely help the race a lot if you have a navigating software with 3D and terrain and all that, and then you know the yeah. best, uh, track course in a 3D uh, 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 plotting, like where it was at as doing so far, and then, yeah. yeah. It would, you would have to, you would actually have to learn how to, you just, I mean, I guess it would be one thing to design it, but like when I fly a full-size airplane, I rarely do it. Now I have to use instruments, and even on a clear day, I'm like, uh, I can't do the scan fast enough. <laughs> there was a team in, in uh, Portland that did something with a laptop and was transmitting something back and forth a few years ago, and it looked interesting. I mean, it, it didn't give him an, an advantage to win that we could tell, but it was an interesting thing to have. <clears throat> but like I said, like the, the day we set the record at uh, Cal Valley, that 45 mile an hour flight, like you didn't need anything. I, I could have done it with a, just with a Vario, you know, because the roads are straight, <clears throat> so you don't need to be told how to get there. Um, and the conditions were so good, you just fly with the plane and keep it keep it straight. Actually, that, that day I think you were I was I was kind of getting scared because you were actually like it was actually climbing so fast. I said, like, hey, push it a little harder, push it a little harder. Yeah, the, no, I don't want to push it harder. Cause I thought it was gonna actually get out of sight. We might have needed. But the the plane was actually, the plane was actually yeah. Faster than we going forward or the the lift was so good and it was climbing so fast that once you hit the ceiling of your visibility, <clears throat> it doesn't pay. To slow down anymore, to gain because you can't gain any more altitude. You're capped by the visibility. So now you're pushing it as fast as you can push it at the visibility limit, which, <clears throat> I mean, strategy-wise, is a great place to be. It's a scary place to fly because, you know, especially if there are clouds and you're dancing with clouds, you know, you you get a little nervous. Um, <clears throat> That depends on the plane. Um, <clears throat> we've seen a lot of planes blow up. Um, this airplane, actually, I would be reluctant to push over 90 or 100. <clears throat> the rest of the ones we have, I don't think could be broken in the air because they have uh, carbon extruded carbon stick spars assembled with vertical grain balsa and then vacuum bag socked with a carbon sock on a 45. And you can, you can put your full body weight on that spar. So, and then you, you put a joiner, a permanent embedded joiner in the middle and you've got pretty good sized joiners, you know, yeah, at the tip. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just and they're solid. A lot of stuff we do is just kind of repurposed. <laughs> yeah. And the tails are pretty, pretty stout. I mean, the, the biggest fear is usually blowing the stab off and then the plane tucks and then yeah. the wing blows up upside down. But. Okay. Why don't we continue without the questions, but I'll turn, I'll get the okay. go to meeting. I'll check with Gary. Gary, any, any questions from your end? All right. Thank you, Gary. Okay, so let's uh, thank Don and Greg. Thank you.